I'll tell you my funny Eddie Van Halen story. All right. So it was back. <laughs> Boy, man, it, it might have been 84, somewhere 84, 85, something like that. But anyway, I, I told you, I used to fly down to LA and I used to music. And the other thing I have a passion for is sports. So I flew down to LA. It was the classic Boston, LA Lakers game. And I would grab my cousin again. And uh, I'd go to the, the forum in, in Ingleside, L.A., and I'd go to the game. Okay, so we go to the game, and we're, you know, sitting there. And I think uh, one of the games, like, back then the A-team was real big, and there's the <laughs> Mr. T or whatever from the A-team sitting next behind me. And, uh, you know, yeah. uh, whatever. Okay, but yeah. I noticed that in a – in a booth because I was up the bowl a little bit, but there were like these little luxury, they weren't even booths. They were just luxury and not luxury, but they were like reserved really good seats around the bowl of the first where they could get in and out real quick. And guess who walks in Eddie Van Halen with Valerie Bertinelli. But anyway, at that time, Eddie <coughs> Van Halen was fucking smashed. <laughs> Smashed, rip boring <laughs> drunk or whatever he was on. But, and of course, once you see him like in the first quarter and he's there with Valerie and they're sitting there, you're going to watch him as much as you're watching the game, you know? Oh, yeah. It's like, worst thing is to have Eddie Van Halen anywhere near you. So I'm looking over there and, you know, midway through the first quarter, he passes out. Oh. And then uh, <laughs> he never gets up for the rest of the game. And then uh, the game ends. And I think the Lakers won and everybody's, you know, and, and we're making our way out, except we didn't want to make our way out. We wanted to walk out with Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, exactly. So we waited. And when he woke up, I'll never forget, we were watching him. She shook him and he's like, you know, all clear out and blurry eyed. Where am I? And he looks around and finally she goes, get up. Let's get. Up. So then he gets up and then she has like a face to face. Like, you know that feeling when your girlfriend, your wife, whoever, <laughs> they're bitching you out because you're stone cold, drunk, passed out, oh, yeah. and you're fucking not doing what they want you to do. But when he's getting bitched out, me and my cousin, are, <laughs> no one's there except me and my cousin, and we're yelling, Edward Van Halen! Edward Van Halen! And he, he breaks his gaze with her. And he looks over with this real funny, big ass smile. And he's just smiling at us, like nodding his head up and down. <laughs> and she's just continuing to bitch. And I think I had pictures of her bitching at him. And then we even walked down uh, the aisle. I, I got picture real close to him. But anyway, we said hello, shook his hand, whatever. But that was my one time with Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> That's a cool story. I'll tell you a funny James Hetfield story. Because I knew Metallica back in the early days, but I was more, um, Kirk was close with me, closer. I, I even saw Legacy with Kirk at the Guerneville Theater. Up in, and I'll never forget, Kirk told me, we're sitting there watching Legacy. And Kirk Hammett tells me um, that uh, we're, we, we just finished watching Legacy. He goes, you know, they remind me of me when I was in Exodus. And from that moment, I kind of knew that they were going to be the next big thing because when Kirk Hammett tells you that, yeah, you know, yeah. and, okay. So now fast forward again, you know, I don't, uh, I, I would be, uh, Kirk would put me backstage, everything all the way. I, and then I got to know Jason Newstead really well. I'll tell you a story about that, but, uh, I didn't know, I didn't like have conversations with Lars, uh, Lars and James. I mean, I would say hello and I'd be in groups of people where they were talking, but it wasn't like a friend, like, oh, hey, Walter, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. um, I remember we were at a party and Jay Sipful was standing there and one of his good friends, Dan, Dan R., who's legendary here in the Bay Area, and he was a really good friend of James. And when I walked up to this group, uh, Dan says, Hey James, uh, do you know my friend Walter? And he and he looked over at me, and he had this smirk on his face, and he and he took this long time. He just looked around with a smirk, and he goes, "Yeah, this is the guy that brought down the hotel." <laughs> <laughs> so I know that 
James knows who I am, who I who I was. From but the again, dis- from the it's destruction really my life caused. story. <laughs> it's good or is it bad? You know. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I got I got I got a ton of a great source, but I will tell you my Jason Newstead story. So I okay. I had another friend I grew up with. His name was Kevin Holt, lived out in the Sunset District. He happened at the time. He became a stockbroker, but that's another story. A successful life doing that. But before that, he was uh, working at Guitar Center when Jason first joined the band. Uh, he, he uh, I get this phone call from Kevin Holt at Guitar Center. He goes, hey, Jason just left here. And uh, I can't get him his gear till tomorrow that he just ordered. But if you come over here with your station wagon and maybe bring it to him, um, that would be cool. If you could do that for him, for me, I said, of course I'll do that. So I go down there. I load up whatever he's getting. The cab, I don't know what he was getting. But the truth of the matter is I, I drove out to that Metallica house with, and delivered it and brought it into the you know, here is me and Jason. Or nobody else but me and Jason. There, and he loads it up into the room, and he starts playing. You know, of course, these musicians they start riding on the equipment, hooking it up. Yeah, and yeah. He's explaining to me that uh, a lot of the stuff uh, he got to to have uh, Cliff's old stuff, but he needed the, some newer stuff to incorporate it with you know the newer sound or whatever. But you know, so he had to make it work, right? So he was uh, getting his head whatever it was that he had bought because i'm not a real technical person but i knew he got this equipment and he hooked it all up and he put the pedal board you know that wall pedal like cliff had and and, uh the first thing you know we smoked a joint and the next thing you know the first song he's playing is for whom the bell tolls so that was kind of a a cool (laughs) moment for me because he wasn't even played and i think uh later on uh, that month, they played uh, the first shows with Jason Newstead were actually at the at the Petaluma Phoenix Theater in Petaluma, California. Because I picked him up from the from the airport when he came back from from uh, Master of Puppets in Europe, and he gave me I still have it a Master of Puppets European sweatshirt with all the dates on the back, and uh, he was always real good with me. From that moment on, it was like I didn't. Uh, bother Kirk would put me on the list. Jason, since he was new, and and Jason would put me on the list for anything that I wanted to go to. And he'd come out to my apartment on Forty Fifth Avenue. I remember I had Metallica posters like up on the ceiling. The whole place was covered in rock memorabilia, metal, and he went around signing the Metallica posters <laughs> that were. You know, I was like, yeah, sign them. He's like going around signing them. I noticed a couple of posts that you've been posting. You found a lot of your old um, T-shirts and things. Because I even saw a couple of T-shirts that I actually had a long time ago. Yes. Um, well, yeah. I'll, I'll say something funny about that. There's two stories <laughs> that I'll say about that. Uh, probably me and Harold Omen. Harold O. Yeah. As you might. Yeah. Um, of course, he wrote a great book with Brian Liu that we all know about. He, he basically... And I have probably have, if anybody could say, we have like metal museums because we were just there from the start until now, and we've known everybody, and we've col- and we're collectors, and we've collected through everything. And I don't do it for money; I do it for personal use. So yeah. what you saw was what I posted was I I've been trying to reorganize my garage, and the second part of the story is this girl. That posted on Facebook, a friend of ours, and she said, "Can anybody help me? Uh, my T-shirts are 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 taking up my closet. I don't know what I'm going to do." And I and I wrote her back saying, uh, "My my T-shirts are taking over a garage, a two car <laughs> garage. Okay, I don't even know if you can imagine a two car okay. garage full of my shit. Yeah, but put it really everywhere. It's uh, I put them in plastics, and then they're." they're like body bags on top of each other these plastic things and they there's they go sky high and they um and i decided uh i was reorgan i call it uh these cubes i've made in these guitars uh, in these garage spots 
and I make these blo- you know these giant blocks of just uh, plastic. But I was trying to set that up, and I took one out that I had a some plastic broke, a container broke, and I had to repackage it. And what you saw was probably like thirty or forty shirts that were in this one container, and it just happened that that container broke, and I had to repack it. And so oh, you got. I just took a picture of each shirt, and uh, yeah, f- going way back, huh? Those those t-shirts, uh, a little slice of 1983, Ingve and Accept, and, Iron Maiden, uh, Iron Maiden. I I don't know how I packed them together, but I know this: that I moved 12 years ago from one place, and they were in storage. They'd been in storage before that. They were in storage. I mean, um. <laughs> And another person, oh, I love it. Somebody put, like when I posted those pictures of those shirts and someone put, wow, I wish I would kept my, my concert t-shirts from the early 80s. Man, I really miss that. And then I wrote underneath it, I go, uh, you're, uh, you're, what, what, you, what I have is, your, is, is my curse because I've kept everything. <laughs> it's actually my curse because now I have so much shit. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I don't want to just sell it. When I die someday, I want my T-shirts to go back to the bands that they came from. I just want the people that made the music and made the artwork and things. I might not even be around. Maybe you weren't that big or had that big of an impact. Or And if you did, I still want it just because nobody saves shit like me. And even back in the early days of Testament, I would buy a brand new shirt. And I'd buy a second one to wear and one to put away brand new. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And not to mention all the shirts that the bands themselves started giving me. And then when you go on tour, you come back with 15 shirts. And every tour you go on, you come back with 15 shirts. And and it all adds up. So uh, that's what I got to say about that. But maybe, uh, yeah, just watch my Facebook. Maybe I'll post some more about that. But that was just one container. But you can imagine how many there are. Yeah, like your uh, pick collection too. You sent me a lot of pictures of those uh, picks that you collected through the years. Yeah, and like I said, yeah, picks. I used to love picks, and then and drumsticks. And you gotta see, I'll send you a picture of my drumstick box because it's oh. one <laughs> big container, like you put the t-shirts in, except it's just full of drumsticks. If you can imagine going back from earliest Metallica legacy all the way up forbidden all the way to present so whenever i get drumsticks i just drop them in and in fact the funny thing is is that my drumsticks i thought someone had stole them because in my garage i couldn't find them and finally i started reorganizing a couple weeks ago and i found them they were buried underneath all sorts of other shit i pulled them out and i hadn't seen them in like 12 years and i had like about 10 or 12 drumsticks that I had gotten since now I just had laying around. So I threw them in there, you know, I try to like label them and throw them in, but, um, that's what I do. I save stuff. I'm OCD. That's another one of my traits. I am when I am. I started, uh, doing, you know, I did videos. I've also done lights. I started doing lights and then, you know, on these hometown gigs, like Chuck would go, Hey, you're going to do lights for us. I said, yeah, I'll do lights. So I started, just learning basic things. And I'm not like a light man on a computer. I can put scenes. I can do things. I can make it. I just know the music really well. And Chuck knew that. And I grew into that. And because he put me behind the lights, like during, you know, the gathering period and up, he would, they would use me. Then Exodus started using me. Like I did lights the last show that Bailoff ever did in yeah. Sacramento. Did that show i did a lot of shows where they didn't take uh, a light man and they were playing around here and they needed somebody and i could i like to say i could fake it and even one time when we were on tour the, the the sound man the elf we used to call him he got uh he's diabetic and somehow his medicine and somehow he had to go to the hospital and he was he had to miss like three shows of the tour he was in the hospital so I remember at that time, they're all like, okay, now you're the light man. So, and I remember the, the first time, so I'm all nervous. I got to, now I got to do lights on a regular tour thing and I'm, I'm up there doing it. And I remember this kid, 
like I was just playing with it, trying to, I'm nervous and I'm fucking going, how am I going to do this? And this now, and, and this kid walks up to me, 16 years old. And he looks up at me. I'm looking down at him. I, hey, what's up? He goes, man, he goes, you work for Testament? I go, yeah. He goes, man, you got the best job in the world. But little as you know, I'm just the filling guy doing this. But, um, but that's how Chuck is. He made, um, me, once, once people saw me do their lights, then the next thing you know, Skin Lab, I'm doing Skin Lab, I'm doing Exodus. But, okay, then let's see. I wanted to talk also about ACDZ, Steve Souza's uh, ACDC tribute band, that I also, I put that together. Mm. Um, it was my idea. And I'll tell you about that real quick. Um, so ACDZ, I'd like to say, is the world premier best ACDC tribute band in the whole world. I mean, if I had to say there's one band that does ACDC besides ACDC, it's ACDZ with Zach Bro. Yeah, and he, he does the um, Bon Scott era, right? Only right, only the Bon Scott era. But and at the time, I knew that he sung on a fabulous uh, disaster. I knew that he, uh, what did he do? Either Dirty Deeds or what was it? I think it was that Dirty Deeds. But anyway. I knew that he that his biggest influence is Bon Scott. I knew that he could sing Bon Scott, and I was drunk. We were at a at a Fourth of July party at John Allen's house in Antioch in his backyard at the time, and we were drinking. And everybody was there. Steve DiGiorgio lives across the street from John Allen. You know Chuck. All the you know Phil Dumble. Everybody was at this, uh, we used to go to these uh, 4th of July parties at John Allen's house and we were there. And it just came up in my mind that that Steve sings uh, ACDC so well. And then I thought about it. And uh, so I at that party, I, I pulled John Allen, the drummer for Status, aside. I said, hey man, can you play? Um, can you play ACDC? Oh, fuck yeah, with one hand. So I go, I love it. And then I said, how how would you like it if, if uh, so I got Steve, got them two together, and we said, why don't we form a band? And then I said, I already know the bass player. I already got that figured out. We're going to ask Elena. Uh, and Elena won a competition for bass uh, for Metallica. She won a Metallica contest to play the bass or something. I forget. But she was in another band called The Magica. But she's a great female bass player. And I thought, wow, what an interesting thing to put John Allen, Zetro, and then to throw in her. And threw her in. And then we needed an Angus. That's the one thing we're missing. So I had an idea how we got an Angus. So I, I knew that we did. I, I wanted to get this band going. So I wanted to do an album. Uh, and I, my original thought was, let's get an album, get all these guest guitar players playing the Angus. And I asked Phil Demmel, he said yes, and all these other guitar players from around, they all said yes. But when that happened, uh, Blabbermouth picked up the story. And, oh, new band, ACDZ, uh, looking for guitar player uh, that plays like Angus. Okay, because we wanted a regular guy, and then we wanted some other guy to come in and play guest solos. But okay, so it got publicized, and uh, one of the guys that contacted me directly was the guy from Riff Rap. His name's Dave Chapman. He's made a career of playing Angus Young. He is the man. He puts on that uniform schoolboy outfit, and he is Angus for an hour and a half. You would think no. He plays it lick for lick. He runs up and down. He spins around on his back. He he does the whole nine yards. He's had a career of doing Angus. Mm -hmm. And I always tell Zetro and Dave this. I go, Steve, without Dave, you're just another cover band doing ACDC. And I tell Dave, without Zetro, you're just another cover <laughs> band. like You're doing Riff Raff in Sacramento. Yeah. But, you know. But if both you guys together, you guys make up, um, you know, you, you, you were, we got something here. And oh, yeah. that was 15 years ago or whatever. And we're playing the, coming up on the 24th so in Concord, California. He does shows uh, sporadically off a tour when he can. And Will Carroll's now in the band. John Allen uh, moved away. 
and uh, and Will Carroll's in the band. And actually, the rhythm guitar player now is uh, is Joe Proto from. Uh, he plays in a band called Vane, uh, who I love. Vane's an old '80s um, glam band from San Francisco, mm. but uh, he plays that and. Oh, it's great. Note for note, uh, these guys uh, play and and know it. And oh, 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 and the newest addition is Mike Butler, who, if you remember, played on Force of Habit, the bass on Force oh, yeah. of Habit. Yeah, yeah. So you have Zetro, Mike Butler, Will Carroll from Death Angel, Joel Proto, and you got Steve Zetro, who's as the frontman. And I would like to think, and Zetro wants to take it to the next level, and we're looking to try to get residencies in, in hotels and casinos, and we're looking to get out and do something in between his exodus commitments. Mm. So look for ACDZ in the future to start you know, playing around or be, maybe be on a tour someday. Mm. But, yeah, uh, I've seen footage of it. It's, actually, it's really, really good. Really, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's uh, it's it's spot on. If you want, spot, yeah, they're trying exactly. to speak, they're not trying to do it different. They're trying to make it as authentic and real as possible, and that's that's the beauty of it because you're not getting it. And when they ACDC needed a singer to fill in for Brian Johnson recently, I uh, management uh, Tony Isabel actually called me and i put some videos together and we sent it to their management they never picked steve what if they picked steve <laughs> maybe steve's an acdc today maybe yeah. steve's on that stage you know can you think about it a younger singer with all those old guys in acdc brian johnson's great because i love back in black but it kind of yeah. got watered down as the years go by with that but um steve could do it and too bad he can't. <laughs> I'd love to see it. Yeah, that, that'd be really cool. Yeah, if he was able to actually front them and maybe go out on a tour or something. Yeah. You know? uh, this is interesting. I'm only going to tell you this for the first time. Okay. But I have another idea. All right. Because you, know, uh, you know who else Zetro can sing? I know that he can sing. And I, I want to tell him this, but I don't want it to interfere with the ACDC. He can sing, except. Like you wouldn't believe. So I would love to do some early accept and like, you know, have Doug Piercy or some legendary guitar player team up with uh, or two legendary guitar players and team up and do just old upset accept. Mm. Now that would rule. Another band that I'm actually going on tour with next month, they're called potential threat and they've been around since the mid eighties. Mm. And if you can imagine a sound like early Metallica. That's what they sound like. And there's these two brothers, the, the drummer and the guitar player singer. He just plays Hetfield's guitar uh, and plays the old riffs. Metallica like they're not, it's not a, it's not a, it, it's, it's a heavy influence and a welcome one. Yeah. But going on tour with them and another band from Germany called artillery. Yeah. I've heard of artillery. Yeah. yeah they're, they're around. So we're, gonna go around it starts in austin um in austin texas i just told a story about and we end in toronto so it should be fun for for a month and i'll be driving and uh doing kind of like a little tour managing of the of their small band it'll just be us and four members and uh that should be fun but anyway check out potential threat if you like the old metallica check them out that's another good band. What else can we talk about? How about your personal philosophy and how would you sum all these things we just talked about up? All right. I went to all Catholic uh, grammar school, all boy Catholic high school. I went to the same high school Tom Brady, Len Swan, and Barry Barnes went to. But that comes back to that I was always pushed – you know, to do good in um, in school because it's a high uh, a curriculum. And I did some college, but when I met these guys in my lower, early 20s, I chose not to go on with school. I chose to go on tour. Mm. And I've always made that choice to do what's in my heart 
and to not worry about money or fame or fortune. What really counts in your life is life experience. And if you're a musician, do it. If you're going to drive the truck, do it. If you're going to sell the t-shirts and a kick, do it. If you're going to be anything, do what your heart tells you and you'll live. I, I, I tell that to my girlfriend and she's getting ready to retire next year. I tell her, just retire now. You're going to live, but you'll have more experience of not going to work and having to get up and go to work and do eight hours, five days a week. You know, so that's my thing is I, you know, I probably like my sister. She went to university of Santa Barbara, got her degree, got into a startup and, uh, millions of dollars later, she's, she's rich. And, um, you know, I never, I never pushed myself like that because I didn't want that type of responsibility. Mm. And to me, um, traveling with bands, seeing bands, um, that's what matters. So I've always had a, a great connection with uh, music through that and uh, through the bands from around here and the other bands that I've met. And I've met some, some great, great friends, lifetime friends. But yeah, to do things for the love of it, you know, everybody, you'll live, you'll live. But your experiences when you're an old man like me and looking back and you did what you wanted to do, not yeah, what other people yeah. want you to do or to be, have that fame and success. Now, you don't have to live like a bum, but, you know, yeah. on, to live on the streets. That's not what I mean. I mean, you know, just you can do things to make it but to do to go where your heart is and that's like whatever but also if you're up and incoming musician think of it like a pro football star you know you have to go to the right you have to start out the right way and you have to learn and put in the time and just practice 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 but that's what it is and it's your heart telling you that and you have about as good of a chance of making it as a musician uh, as a big time musician as a sports star about the same rate because you know and anybody can play their hometown at a small club in a small band you can do that and you can live your dream that way that's fine but you have to put in the time and you never know if that magic is going to show up with those four other guys you're playing with and when you have that magic then it's magical but you, you got to put in the time the effort and to go out and do it and don't let everybody tell you that you can't i definitely appreciate you taking the time to uh talk to me cool stuff all right james keep it heavy okay all Thanks. right brother see ya <laughs>